as you share your faith, as you learn scripture, you're proving out your salvation in the sense that you understand that salvation begins your Christian life, it doesn't end it. And your salvation there is you have a work in progress and you go to the instruction book, the Bible, and as you learn more, you get an opportunity to share more of what you've learned. And uh, it's not going to be very good, though, if you don't learn it adequately and correctly. So you have to actually prepare. The method of preparation uh, for your being ready with an answer is to study the scriptures in a proper manner, according to the rules of language, context, and logic, the reading rules. And you do that, and then you run into people who will say, well, what about this? What about that? And you have to go back and dig. <clears throat> That's a lot of topical stuff as well, and you have to be careful reading topical even more so than reading verse by verse because the topical provides uh, opportunities for you to make a lot of errors. Uh, you make assumptions, you cherry pick verses to get a quicker answer because it's a lot more difficult to, to uh, actually produce a, a topical study uh, that's correct than it is to just uh, slap one verse down on the thing and say that, that ends it all. You're learning to be a politician when you start cherry-picking verses in the Bible. And that's why most people who claim to be Christians are more like politicians than Christians. any case, contradictions in the Bible that I've come across, and I have uh, research volumes that I can do my homework and read and get a up, heads up on it. Because uh, at times when a question comes up, you don't have time to, to study five or six or seven chapters in the Bible to get to chapter 8 which uh, depends upon the context of the first seven chapters. Uh, if it's in Romans, I've done the whole book, so now I can just read my notes and see where the context flows, and then do your topical study. Well, the first thing, and contradiction that I state, stated first, is before the cock crows, once or twice did Peter deny the Lord three times. Uh, we covered this the last time, but let's go over it one more time. So we can begin the contradictions from the beginning. Notice there's a certain amount of repetition in Bible study that's, a, that's a very effective in helping you to learn because you go back over and over something and you realize you've fallen short on, or you've made a presumption that isn't true. You find something that in your thinking isn't followed through properly or you haven't produced enough evidence to provide and support the point that you've made. <clears throat> so before the cock crows, once or twice did Peter deny the Lord three times. <clears throat> there seems to be some passages there that contradict one another. Mike Scott, minister, uh, states in www.scripturesay.com. I go there once in a while and find out what they have to say. If you're careful, <clears throat> you realize the normative rules of language, context, and lo logic demand a certain amount of evidence for each point they make and you build it as a building block. You start at the foundation of the building and don't start building the roof first. So you can have an idea of what the roof should be, the conclusion, but you have to build something underneath that that supports it point for point, brick for brick. So Matthew 26, 34, Mike Scott says, Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, he's quoting, Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Luke 22, 34, and he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. And John 13, 34, again, says something a little different. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. And Mark 14, 30, we have four different uh, places. Are they different and contradicting one another? Mark 14, 30, and Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. <clears throat> well, actually, this boils down to uh, four people witnessing an accident between a, a number of vehicles on the streets of a city. And they all have different vantage points. Uh, they all uh, provide certain amount of information that may, not, may or may not be contradictory, supportive, corroborative. Uh, somebody on one one side of the uh, accident would be around the corner and see it begin at that side, but on the other side of the building they can't see it because the building's in the way. And this happens all the time. So it's not unusual that this might be the possibility here. Let's see. All the gospel writers mention that the rooster will crow before Jesus Peter denies Christ. 
they all mention the number of denials, <clears throat> the most significant num numerical detail here as being three. Mark mentions that the rooster will crow twice after the denials. Is this a discrepancy? Well, I say not if you go by the norm of the rules of language, context, and logic, which requires evidence to support your point of view, who, what, why, where, when, and to whom. And I, this uh, pastor, Mike Scott, says, I don't believe so. Essentially, Christ's words could be paraphrased as follows. Peter, in the next few hours, you will deny me three times. In fact, before the rooster crows. It seems, since there is no real contradiction here, that Mark simply gives us greater details about the circumstances in this incident. Often this is the case in the Gospels, one writer giving an additional detail or two to the story. Neither, nothing contradictory, sim simply illuminating. One commentator has observed, Al Ford, that roosters are accustomed to crow twice, at or near midnight, and not far from daybreak. Since very few people hear the first crowing, the ge term generally denotes the second. Therefore, all the gospel writers are referring to this second crowing. Genesis creation account creates light before the sun, moon, and stars. That's the second point here in our contradictions. Let's see if there are any contradictions. <clears throat> Farrell Till. Nope, it's still it's not there. See, I'm glad I post these things. Before, uh, if I give a reference, sometimes they're not there anymore. <clears throat> Farrell Till says, but as any ast astronom astronomer knows, <clears throat> evening or night and morning, meaning daylight, result from the Earth's rotation with respect to the sun. With no sun, there would have certainly been an evening or night, but there could have been no morning. Till goes on to say, on the fourth day, when God created the two growing what's it? He's assuming the account ahead of time that, that, there, that we're going to have to rely on. The fourth day when God created the two great lights, the sun and the moon, he created the stars too. This creation of the rest of the universe was treated by the Genesis writer, or, or writers, as it were, little more than an afterthought. Wow. What evidence do you have of that? He made the stars also. So Till goes on, to the pre-scientific mind. There you go. See, one assumption after another, and then you conclude from there. To the pre-scientific mind that wrote this. How do you know minds weren't scientific in those days? It probably made sense. To him or her, the Earth was undoubtedly the center of the universe. But today we know better. And you have evidence that today we know better because the Earth's location in the Milky Way is off-center? <clears throat> really, that's no proof. Even real scientific astronomers won't tell you that that's definitive proof that the Earth is not or in the center of the universe. It's not in the center of the Milky Way, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's in the center, not in the, in the center of the universe. Till goes on to say the solar system of which Earth is only a tiny part is itself an infinitesimal uh, speck in the universe. Surely then the creation of the star would not have occurred so quickly and suddenly if six days were needed to create the world. How do you know that? Scientists now know that the creation of stars is an evolutionary process that is still ongoing. Actually, we don't know that. We don't have definitive proof that that's the issue. We haven't found a, a birth area of stars. We've looked at those and find out that's not the case. We'll look at that later. Matter coalesces. Stars ignite shine and eventually burn out or explode. From the existence of heavy elements in our solar system, astronomers generally agree that it formed from debris left over from a supernova that occurred billions of years ago. The pre-scientific Genesis writer has knew none of this, however, and that is why he viewed the creation of the universe as an Elohistic afterthought. Wow. No modern scientifically educated writer would have made that mistake. Oh, we're so much more enlightened. Answers from the Bible. Let's go into this. Light was created before a light emanating bodies. <clears throat> Let's look at the Genesis account and see what it actually says. God creates the light emanating heavenly bodies. On the first day, God created light. Then on the fourth day, he created light emanating bodies. Uh-oh. What's this? Let there be lights. 
text says. Lights. Notice lights, plural, literally, in the Hebrew, mayor or light givers. This is different from Genesis 1-3, which states, let there be light. Or singular, light singular, let there exist the whole spectrum of visible and invisible light waves which emanate out throughout God's newly created heavens and earth. But not from any particular created source of light givers, whether you believe or agree with the writer of Genesis. You can't impose upon him something he didn't say or write. So light was created first, and then God created light givers. Who do you think the light came from? It doesn't tell you the source. It doesn't mean it ne th there wasn't another source. The fourth day witnessed the establishment of the sun and moon in their functions with respect to the earth. Since the sun now provides all the energy received by the earth for its geological processes, this event also has profound geological implications. Undoubtedly, there were innumerable other creative and developmental processes taking place during the six days, get myself out of the way here, as the entire earth was being fitted as a wonderfully harmonious dominion for man to subdue. Henry Morris says, on the first day he had said, let there be light, the Hebrew word transliterated or. On the fourth day he said, let there be lights, or light givers, may or. Intrinsic light first, and then generators of light later is both the logical and the biblical order. Could not God have created light emanating from whatever source he wanted? Did he? If you're reading the, the book, the Bible, and you don't agree with what it says, at least agree with what the writers are trying to say, whether you believe it or not, and that is that the, the light-giving bodies came after the light came. Now, we don't apply scientific principles that we think we know today that aren't even theory. They're just guesses. They're, they're, uh, they're uh, a case made for one particular point of view or another. But there's no definitive proof because science is create, creating a, an ability to observe something, observable, and then it's repeated so you can observe it in a consistent manner. And the more the repetitions, the better. And then it's, it's falsifiable. You can set up a control so that to find out if the information being tested is actually coming up valid. And then you can say, well, there's some validity here. Let's keep looking. And it might, it might become a good logical model. And then much more later, it'll, it'll become a theory and scientific fact. The purpose of the light and the light givers was to divide light from darkness. So the chief purpose of both the light and the first of the first three days and the light givers of all later days was to divide the light from the darkness. And this can only mean that the two regimes were essentially identical. The duration of the days and the nights was the same in each case, and the directions of light emanation on the earth from space must have been in the same in each case. In other words, light rays were impinging on the earth as it rotated on its axis during the first three days of essentially the same intensities and directions as those which would later emanate from the heavenly bodies to be emphasized and placed on the, the fourth day. So, from the first day light arrived without coming from the sun, moon, and stars, which were not created yet. Later, the light emanating bodies were created to mark the seasons and the days and the years. So, light was coming onto the earth during the day, but not from the sun, and during the night, not from the moon and stars, for they had not yet been created. The light came from God. There you go. If such a concept sounds strange, well, let it be remembered that it is as easy for God to create waves of light energy as to create generators to produce such waves. And that's what this so-called till uh, doesn't understand. If God created the heavens and the earth, then certainly he can create light. And if you don't believe that, that doesn't matter. This is what the, the writers wrote. If it's believable, it's a matter for you to determine that on your own personal reading of it, see if it shows some consistency and uh, lack of, of uh, conflict and contradiction. There was no need for such generators except to serve the additional function after man's creation of marking signs and seasons, days and years. This phenomenon will again occur in eternity future. Why didn't Till go back to Isaiah 60, 19 to 20? Because he doesn't care about reading the Bible. He's just going to stay at a distance and throw uh, mud at it. If you open it up, it might uh, bear some uh, information for you. That